You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry. We've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live every Friday at 1.30 p.m. Central, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike Options Pricing and Analysis Software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. And now, get ready to to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for TWIFO. This Week in Futures Options, the program we're Pretty much the name says it all. We break down the week that was, and in some cases still is, from a futures options, trading and trending and volatility and skew and all that other fun stuff perspective. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting Options Insider Radio Network. You guys know how to get us by now. If you want the full kit and caboodle, the full archive going back 11-plus years on the old network, the website or our app are the easiest place to get all that stuff to really do a deep dive. If you want the most recent stuff, iTunes, tune in, Stitcher, subscribe to the podcast there. You'll get it on your device of choice. And if you want it really in your ear holes the second we're talking about it, then you can join us live on Mixler every Friday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, again, buy that Mixler link. You see it out in all of our Twitter and all of our social media on the website. Grab it once, set it, and forget it. Follow us on Mixler if you want, and you'll be notified when we go live. Not just with this show, but all the shows we do uh, throughout the week. Bob Hughes earlier than this, Option Blocks. Um, did a trading tech talk on that earlier this week. So all sorts of fun stuff hitting that live feed. A little, a little fun bonus for all you guys out there who like your stuff immediate. 
and joining me, of course, by the way, however you listen live after the fact, make sure you hit us up. Questions, comments, insights, a lot of good ones coming into the show this week. We'll try to get to them later on in the show. And joining me to help me do just that, my cohort, my partner in crime for the world of all things futures options, Mr. Nick Howard, the founder of Bantix Technologies and creator of a little platform we like to use around here once or twice called Quick Strike. Mr. Nick, welcome back to the show, sir. Yes, uh, very excited this week, more than usual, for our special guest. So, looking forward to it. Yes, I could tell your tone is ab- above the normal, uh, the normal low level here. You're, I can <laughs> tell that, Friday. that that bit right. of excitement just see, just sneaking into your voice there. It's hard to tell for the listeners, maybe, but I, I've heard him enough to know to know, and he's that extra notch of excitement. And he's excited because we are joined by a guest to help us tackle. The week that has been out there and all things crude and what a week it has been. Uh, we are joined by Tracy Shukart. You may know her better from her handle over there on Twitter at Shy Girl. Tracy, welcome to the Twifo program. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> and Tracy, as we are wont to do with all of our all of our first timers here on the network. I want you to go ahead and break down for our listeners a little bit of your background in the space and how you came to be blogging and tweeting about the crude oil futures markets. Um, well, I started, I was actually, um, I, I was a, I sold medical devices in California, medical grade plastics. And I decided, <laughs> exciting, uh, I decided one day that I hated my job and I literally packed everything I had, quit my job and moved to Chicago to get in the industry and just went and knocked on doors basically until I got like a total boiler room to to hire me. (laughs) And I started as an options uh, broker for futures. So from from medical sales reps, you just decided one day, I want to dive deep down the rabbit hole of uh, of listed derivatives. And uh, so you got you got into options on futures. And was there a particular product area that you specialized in or how'd you get lured to the to the dark side of crude <laughs> um actually it was because you know well i was a broker right so um basically you're just calling a million people a day and then asking them to give you money to trade options and so um my first winning trade was a crude trade <laughs> so that's that's how it became what it became <laughs> Pretty good, pretty good. Well, you got to start somewhere, right? So, uh, right, exactly. Yeah. You, uh, yeah, you remember the first winner, and you forget about the losers as quickly as possible if you can. Right, right. Well, my background is also in Middle East studies, so it all kind of fit together. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that works. <laughs> and so, Tracy, so you obviously worked as a broker, and you and you made that first uh, crew trade, which set you on your path for life. Uh, are you pretty much now? I spend most most of your time, uh, you know, managing your own. Your own crude trading, or, or you know, I know you spend a lot of time uh, tweeting out a lot of information about the crude markets. Uh, you know, are you spending most of the time managing your own money, or what are you up to these days? Yep, exactly. I, tra- I trade for myself in my own account. So, kind of made the progression throughout the years. I worked on the trade board for a while, and I worked at a prop firm, and then eventually now I'm on my own. There you go, moving all over, all over the place, hither and yon. In fact, did I see? I know your handle is Chai Girl, but I, did I see you're actually coming to us out of Quebec? Is that correct? So, yeah, I'm in Montreal. So uh, a little Chai Girl remote, I suppose. <laughs> Chai Girl remote, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Remote, remote Chai, Chicago by way of Montreal, a well-known, a well-known connection. Well, let's get into it. Uh, it. Let's get into all things crew. That's the reason you're on the show uh, this week, of course. we're gonna. Obviously, it was uh, a hot week. Uh, for crude, a lot of stuff going on in terms of uh, the net market. We saw actually futures out there in Rally Homa. By the way, you guys can play along with the show as always, cmegroup.com slash twifo, T W I F O. That allows you to look at all the reports that Nick and I are going to look at throughout the show. If you're listening after the fact, I know a lot of you are, then uh, on the podcast, make sure you just change those, uh, those settings so you can see it for today, for Friday, so you can see exactly what Nick and I are, are looking at here on the show. And spoiler alert, it was a strong week for crude uh, with the futures setting out WTI right around 67 and a half, up about 8.5% out there on the week. So just rally home mode. Maybe this is the, all you guys have been writing in for, for weeks and months saying, you know, when are we going to get this big move? When are we going to see crude vol coming back? Well, spoiler alert, you got all of that this week and more. Big move to the upside, big move in vol. Vol up pretty much across the board, multiple handles 
uh, depending on where you're looking on the term structure, obviously, but vol just, uh, shall we say, getting up there again, which is, I think, a welcome thing for a lot of people. Cer certainly paying the rent, as Nick would like to say, out there in uh, all things uh, all things crude. So, Tracy, obviously, this is the market that, uh, that you watch quite a bit. Uh, there was a lot of mixed signals this week. You know, they seemed like there was going to be a net, there's going to be some some bear, net. The data seemed kind of bearish, but then of course macro events had a way of have a way of intervening, and they intervened to the upside. So tell us uh, what what your take was on this week's kind of price action out there in WTI. I mean, basically, you know, what what, what we kind of saw is basically macro events taking place, which is you know generally um, crude is not necessarily. I mean, you know. Um, Geopolitical risk is always factored in, but we had the trade war thing going on, so we saw, you know, crude take a dive a little bit, and then, um, you know, then we had war war, <laughs> then we had a lot of geopolitical risk in uh, the Middle East, sort of a Middle East contagion happening, and uh, basically it hasn't let up since then. Um, so, you know, when it, sort of when it gets to a point like that where you have these overwhelming macro factors, um, you know, things like the report don't really matter that much uh, on you know on another uh you know usually you, you'll see a lot of reaction on those report rise but yes that report was very bearish this week yeah you know it seems like usually the narrative for crude when we're talking about it here on the show is a little bit of a push pull between the opec numbers and the domestic production numbers you know what we're doing in terms of of supply here in the, in the country and demand versus what opec is uh producing and it seemed like uh those numbers uh, we're kind of leaning one way, and then, like you said, the macro uh, kind of intervened. Uh, we saw global supplies coming out of uh, OPEC numbers actually climbing. Uh, that's on top of rising output from non-OPEC producers, so that should usually lead to uh, bearish settlements. Uh, we saw the uh, EIA, a higher move for U.S. crude stockpiles. Uh, so all that would probably usually trend towards, like we said, a, a bit of a bearish week. And then, uh, and yeah, bigger inspected stockpiles, 3.3 million barrels out there uh, for EIA. And yet all of a sudden, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, like you said, macro has a way of intervening. We've got Saudi Arabia fielding off multiple missile attacks, shooting those things down. There were talks before about some, uh, you know, attacks on some of their, uh, some of their tankers and other things like that. Then, of course, the escalating tensions with Syria and everything else, uh, all of that combining to just add to the hodgepodge of volatility that is the Middle East. And when that kind of stuff happens, uh, it ends up, uh, you said trumping, trumping the other data that's going out there. It ends up on the week up five and a half handles or about eight plus percent. Nick, you know, it's been an interesting week to watch uh, crew before we get into the options and the, and the vol and all that fun stuff. What was, what, what was catching your eye out there in, in this kind of topsy-turvy crude week? Well, I, I have a question for Trace because uh, I'm always wondering um, mm -hmm. what the the people who you know Trace. My background is uh, I was an options trader and in, in the rates and stuff like that, so I'm new to the commodities and and over the last few years, but just been more um, you know an observant uh, person as opposed to a trading person in those spaces. But um, you know, the one thing Mark and I are always talking about on the show is people. They want they want crude to rally, right? That's all you hear. We, when are we going to see right. a rally in crude? Do you really care? I mean, I would imagine you don't really care. I mean, do you do you sometimes um, when you're scalping? Do you prefer to have these sort of predefined ranges, or or would you or would you rather be uh, generally bullish or generally bearish when you're trading? I mean, what's the best environment from your standpoint? I mean, generally, I mean, you know, traders usually have one side or the other they like better. Personally, I like the short side better. Of it, trading anything, um, but you know, I, I mean, I, ideally, because I, I swing trade and I day trade. So when I swing trade, yeah, it's great to have like these great moves. But when you have, you know, what we've had this last week, where you're just straight up and the market's not breathing at all, it makes it very difficult to day trade that kind of market. So yeah, I don't like a completely one directional market either, whether it's up or down. Um, when I'm trying to day trade. But generally speaking, I prefer to the short side. Yeah, I think <laughs> I think it, I think in general, in uh, well, I don't know. I, I when I was when I traded when I was trading options, I was more biased towards long gamma than short gamma. So that means I had a tendency to be long. But I recognize the fact that typically the better way to make money more times than not was to, from the short side. And and uh, I just 
I'm always questioning why people would want a commodity to rally that costs us more money in the end. So that's why I well, like. Yeah, seeing no, I mean, I think it's ridiculous that, that uh, this rally, but um, you know, but you know, I, I, I'll trade both sides. I mean, I'm going to trade what's in front of me. So, um, but my preference is a short side, and I don't think that I think we're overpriced right now. You know, Tracy, you mentioned you, you day trade and then you swing trade. You know, walk us through a little bit of, of, of how you do that. Are you mostly, you said you like the short side, so I'm assuming you like the futures. Uh, is it pretty much predominantly WTI futures? You sling a little Brent and also is it pre all pretty much futures or do you do uh, the options on occasion too? You said you got, you initially got lured to the crude oil dark side with uh, brokering on, on the options. So do you do a lot of options out, out there? So I definitely incorporate options into my trading. Absolutely. Um, especially if the market gets too skewed one way or another, um, you know, then I'll start, you know, adding puts or calls depending on, you know, whether the market's up or down. Or if I'm in a position and I feel like I need to hedge myself, then options are great for that too, obviously. So you use options for hedging and you said you also will use them maybe to, to augment uh, your your futures position, that sort of thing. So if you, you said if you want to, you think it's going to rally, but you want to do maybe save a little outlay, you go with a call. Is that your typical use case? So, yeah, I mean, I, I'm usually either if I'm in a major swing trade to kind of, um, you know, there's, well, except for last week, you know, there tends to be a lot of uh, volatility. So you can use options on the opposite side of the trade that you're taking. You know what I mean? Because like, on, yeah, to, to I can't, I can't trade against myself in the futures right. market, um, but I can trade against myself using futures and options. And what's your typical, you know, time horizon? You like to you trade the weeklies? You hold them, trade them intraday? Or are you a little bit longer? How, what's your time horizon when it comes to uh, the options, particularly? Um, I, I, actually, it really just depends on depends on the product. It depends on what I'm doing. I mean, I, um, you know, when I was I, I day trade them a lot um, when I'm expecting some sort of a big move. Then I'm just in and out on a day. Um, otherwise, you know, if I think, you know, if I'm using them for, in, you know, next month I think crude's going to be down three, four bucks, you know, then I'll, you know, get something more in the money and hold them. It really just depends on the kind of strategy that I'm using. But I, I you know, I flip options during the day as well. Like I said, you know, it's a way to kind of trade against yourself. Sure. Well, Trace, I have one more thing to ask you too. So on, another thing we discussed quite a bit, we do, we do talk about crude probably more than any other product on the show. And um, since you are trading options, have you, have you ventured into the weekly stuff, the real short dated stuff, or do you tend to stay in the regular monthly? I, I say in the, I like to have more, Time and yeah, they're just not as liquid yet as I would prefer. Um, right, no, weekly, right. so I mean they're kind of they're rather new and they're just not they're just not as liquid. And with crude, you know, I think that I I find that I like having a little bit more time to get than, the move in to get the move in place that you that you would yeah that trying to, because okay. you know using a weekly. I mean, crude. You could think crude's going somewhere. It could take over a week to get there. Other times it could take a day. <laughs> you never know. So I just like to have the, the time option. Okay. Well, that's, Mark, that's sort of interesting from somebody who uses them very practically, right? We think that there's, we, we, we obviously see that the open interest isn't as good or the, and sometimes the market aren't, markets aren't quite as tight, but, but, uh, but if it's the case that the, that the end user wants to make sure that they have the ability to capture their perspective, the, you know where, where they think things are going, then it makes sense that we're not seeing so much uh, um, so much volume in, in these in the shorter data ones, right? Because what, what what it ends up being is you'll get a you know seven days to expiration on a regular contract trades that'll trade like crazy, but then a seven day weekly you won't see any action. So it's always so I guess that once they get tighter markets um, and uh, a few more participants on, on the market making side, maybe we'll see those finally yeah. reach their potential. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that, you know, and I've talked to other traders too, and, you know, we've all said the same thing. And, you know, if they get a little bit more, a little bit more liquid, um, then I think that, you know, I think people will um, sort of participate a little bit more. I think people are kind of just waiting right now. It takes a while. You introduce a new product, you know, it takes a while for people to get used to that. People are used to 
doing what they usually do, right? So. Yeah, I always like uh, like putting to the guests the questions that we get all the time from our, our audience and on the crew. We get a couple of those. When Nick and I have, have kind of, uh, you know, asked and wondered for a long time why the weeklies never really took off. We've asked just about every guest we've had. We've had different CME people on talking about why that is. But, you know, people will trade the monthly contract all the way down till it's about to expire. So they will trade short duration crude options, just not in the listed weekly contracts, which kind of makes us wonder whether it's not a more of a just a, a systemic thing. The brokers aren't doing a good job of surfacing these or something along those lines where because people will clearly trade short duration crude contracts, uh, but in, for whatever reason, not in the listed weeklies, only when the monthly gets down to that range, which is kind of weird. And the other question we get a lot is, you know, crude, you know, use, what's the use case for options, you know, intraday or longer term. So I always like to hear what people have to say on uh, on that front as well, because, you know, uh, Nick and I have waited on that a bunch of times. <laughs> I like to get a, a diversity of opinion. Speaking of diversity of opinion, Tracy, I know you were talking recently about some article out of, the, what is it, the uh, Times of India there, uh, where the, the Moody's folks going out on a, on a, on a big limb saying that uh, crude is going to be between, uh, WTI going to be between 45 and 65 range for the foreseeable future. Of course, they're, we're outside of that now, so I guess that... Uh, I guess that they've already blown their reign, so maybe they should have been a little bit more optimistic. But I, I know you had some thoughts on this article. You thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, you think there's some? You think that range has some teeth to it, as wide as it is? Well, I think that uh, you know, I think that what we're going to see. Oh, I got some back feed. I think you know, if we go to like seventy or something, I think that that'll be brief. I think crude's kind of found its equilibrium, you know, in this sort of, you know. $60 range. So I kind of expect it's everybody's kind of happy with that producers. Um, you know, it's not too, too expensive. It's not, you know, it's kind of found its base there. So I, I don't think for the foreseeable future, <laughs> but for right now, you know, unless, you know, something drastic changes, I think any spikes uh, kind of above this range will be probably limited and brief. I th well, Mark, we, we joke about it all the time, Tracy, a, a while back. I don't even know how long ago it was now. It was probably inside of, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 months ago. I don't remember when City came out and said the crude was going to be between 40 and 70. So we finally got to right. the high end of their range here. <laughs> so uh, so they were right. It just took them, it took, just took them eight months to get there. Because um, right. we, always, we always laugh at the, I mean, because, you know, from my perspective, just being more options oriented and you and I know you look at the same thing because I see some of the stuff you tweet out of quick strike. You're looking at the open interest, too, because you're looking right. for sort of support and resistance from that kind of uh, right. from, from that I, perspective. Exactly. You know, I want to see what, where's this, you know, I, I kind of use, as you know, I kind of use it for, um, you know, OPEX, op trying to figure out kind of where what range we're going to be in and where, where, where we're going to end up for OPEX. Um, and then I just use it in general to kind of, you know, I, I look at it almost daily just to know where people are positioned, what, you know, what positions are, what the OI change is, you know, where are people moving around, um, just because I, I think it kind of helps you have a framework of, you know, kind of the range that you think this particular month is going to trade in. Now, that isn't always the case, but it's good to know where other people are positioned yeah, for sure. I, I agree. And that's kind of how, like, again, not being a, not being a technical chartist or anything like that. I'm just sort of watching where the activity is there. Some of the other things too, that you can do with that, which you may not have seen and, or, or, or that are available is you can look at that open interest from a, a Greek standpoint too. So you can actually tie the open interest. I just saw see, that. Yeah. So how many deltas are around that or how much volatility, how much Vega is there. So I think that might be another way to get an idea of like how much something's going to get defended at that price. That exactly. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Exactly. So, no, I just saw that on the site. I think it's fantastic. No, that's good. And, and, and the other thing we're trying to do, and I think it'll be helpful and we haven't just haven't had the time to do it. Um, but you know, a lot of times, for instance, Mark and I have talked about trades in in like gold, for instance, and, and we look in our, our charts, Mike mark the max strike, the max OI in a strike. But you know, if something traded 18 months ago on some whim whim of a trade, it's kind of misrepresents that strike, um, you know, pretty right. pretty aggressively. So we're 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 in the process of doing an 
an aged OI report. So you can sort of kind of limit and say, well, how much of this OI is in the last month? How much of it is, in the, et cetera, right? So you can go out and that, that way it really gets you an idea of what the, it's just another way of looking at the, not having to track the change in OI so much, but just looking and seeing how much has been opened very recently. So hopefully those kind of tools will, will help people because, you know, you're, you're, a t you know, and I, and I, and this is why we wanted to have you honest because you're sort of a testament to the people who, you know, who make their living with futures, but the fact that options have answers for futures right. traders as well. So that's really, it's, there's really a lot of range type stuff. There's really a lot of, you know, cause if there's an open interest on a strike, people are defending their positions by scalping the gamma at that point, or, you know, selling futures or buying futures because they think they're in trouble, that kind of thing. So that's really exactly. the biggest thing to tell people out there is that you can use that kind of information to do your job as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you don't need to be an options trader to find, you know, it, it's beneficial to look at options information <laughs> and where people are, because a lot of those positions are tied to futures positions. Right, and that's the other thing people forget. So, anyway, Mark, that was that was really where I wanted to go with that. I wanted to see what she had to say about that. So, thank you very much again. Thank you for being on because it's a yeah, really. Okay. I, I'm so I was. It can ask. I was so excited when Mark said that you were coming out. <laughs> so I was just really, really glad to have you. This is Nick in uh, giddy little schoolboy mode here. So yeah, he's you can tan tell, but he's very excited through his uh, through his. Uh, that's his excited tone. That's about as excited as it gets. But yes, he is. Uh, he is an excited camper. And you're right, Nick. You know, it is kind of. Uh, a fascinating thing. A lot of our audience out there is our futures traders who are maybe thinking about dipping their toes into the options. And they have a lot of these same questions. You know, what can I use options for? What we talk about all the time about the vol, open interest strikes, what the skew was indicating in terms of where the where the options are leaning out there. And we'll get into that in crude in a second. Uh, but still, you know, it's interesting to see, you know, the different use cases people have uh, for the products and the time frame. And again, why nobody trades the win? It's always this catch-22 with the new products, you know, whether it's a, a new product listed off of an existing popular one like WTI or a brand new product. There's always that catch-22. People are always waiting until the volume before they start trading it, but you can't get any volume until people start trading it. So things are always wide. And so it, it is this weird thing. But I think you're probably on to something, Nick. I think it is probably something to do with the, uh, the the brokers not putting the quotes out there, not making it easy to trade the non, you know, non-serial you know months out there, contracts out there, something along those lines. Because people will trade near duration, near term, uh, near term crude, <coughs> just not apparently in the listed weekly. Speaking of what they're trading out there this week, uh, let's get into the old uh, the old Twifo report this week again. CMEGroup.com slash Twifo for you guys to play along with for yourself. And it was an active week crude open interest up nearly six and a half percent overall out here this week. And of all the action, about 40 percent or pretty close to it. Come in in uh, in that front uh, May contract uh, doing uh, the lion's share of the action out there. But uh, ironically, even though that was the busiest month, uh, the number one strike, the biggest uh, the biggest trade out there, the number one strike with a bullet out there this week, actually wasn't in. Wasn't in the May. It was in the June contract. It was the June sixty puts doing about thirty two thousand contracts. Uh, this week, the lion's share actually coming on Wednesday, about half of that, about 16,000 uh, going up on that day. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week, 7,400 on Tuesday, a net pretty strong opening to about 12,000 contracts. So uh, actually on a week where we rallied away from <laughs> the strike, uh, we saw a lot of opening out there. Of course, that was that strike was in peril earlier in the week or maybe closer to it than it is now. Uh, so we could see a lot of action. It's not surprising what we see. A lot of action around these even number strikes and a lot of opening in this case out here in uh, on the 60 puts. And we've gone on number two, a little bit more, uh, a little bit more farther away put. We have even those closer in duration. It was the May 65 puts doing nearly 30,000 contracts for our number two contract uh, with about 12,000 going up on Wednesday. Uh, the rest kind of spread throughout the week. Not much on Monday. The only 18 contracts going up on Monday. So pretty much the rest of the week uh, light, lightened up out there on the 65 puts in May. A net about 8,000 contracts opening. So again, strong opening on the put side on the 60s and the 65s in two different months in June and in, uh, and in May. And then we drop off a little bit to number three, the 64 puts, uh, 26,000 roughly going up there. Also in May, about almost 11,000 going up on Monday. Uh, the rest, again, kind of scattered throughout the week. 6,500 going up today. So pretty robust action up there today. About 6,000 contracts net opening on the week. So, again, a lot of strong uh, positioning 
uh, out there. It's just like a put palooza out here in, in, in crew WTI. Uh, 24,000 of the nice little put strip in May. 62 puts also active. 24,000 of those. Uh, the lion's share actually coming on Tuesday. 8,200 there. Uh, 6,700 on Wednesday. The rest kind of spread out throughout the week. Actually slightly closing. Pretty much unched from an OI perspective. So a lot of back and forth slugging it out there on the 62 puts there in May. Then we got to jump back actually to uh well we got a couple couple vying for the next spot on our list in particular the 68 calls also in may doing about twenty four thousand contracts uh seven thousand going up on wednesday five thousand today so pretty active today again a bit of a slug fest out there pretty much unched from an oi perspective so clearly uh, a lot of action back and forth on that strike and pretty much tied uh, with about 24,000 contracts also out back again to June for the June 70s, rounding out our kind of top five here. Also getting a lot of action. It's been a while since we talked about a 70 strike in anything more than kind of a, a joking fashion. And yet now this week, all of a sudden, that 70 strike is within spitting distance. Uh, June 70s doing 24,000 contracts this week. 7,300 going on Wednesday, 6,000 on Tuesday. The rest uh, split out throughout the week. Uh, total, actually, again, slightly opening, about seven 800 contracts opening. So a lot of back and forth on that 70 strike in June as well. So it's kind of interesting to watch the push-pull of the different strikes and what is what is active what is hot out there we'll do our quick little cursory scan throughout the rest of the quick strikes see if any funky strikes are come up on our radar if you're on the bearish camp uh you're not alone someone was playing out there in the june 2019 38 yes 38 puts uh, pretty active actually 3,000 of those going up today so we don't have oi numbers on that obviously uh but 3,000 someone playing in the 38 puts in june 2019 today 3,000 times so if you're saying what's all this crazy uh bullish stuff going up here or these near-term puts don't worry about it we got some out of the money puts and if out of the money calls let's say the par strike is more your game uh, we got you covered out there as well in both Dece of 2019 and Dece of 2020. The par calls doing about 2,250, which makes me think, let's see, Thursday on the on the 2019, let's also see the pars, but maybe of a, of a calendar spread there. Yes, Thursday on both. So I'm going to guess those are probably related. Bit of a calendar or perhaps a time stupid depending on how you're looking at it. Uh, Mr. Nick will look at the block stuff. He'll know a little more for us in a bit. But still, a lot of action on the pars in Dece 2019 and Dece 2020. Someone got a one-year spread on there, uh, which is kind of interesting. All that brings us around, Mr. Nick. We can mention at the top of the show, it was a good week for crude bulls. It was a good week for crude vol bulls. Uh, what was catching your eye out there from a vol perspective, from a skew perspective, and anything else that was just lighting up this crazy week in crude, sir? Well, I think uh, the first thing to mention is, you know, we, we've been talking lately, at least the last couple of months, how um, the how the how the vol, the at the money vol, if it swings along the volatility curve and 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 trying to take into account whether we whether the change in at the money volatility was due to the fact that it's just traveling along uh, the expiration vol curve or whether it was actual bid that took place. So so this week what we saw is. Um, you know, we we did move along sort of in the path of the vol curve, but we actually saw um, that that vol change to me this week is a real vol change. So there was a there was a firm bid in the volatility, not just a change in a location uh, on the on the uh, on the month's volatility curve. Uh, the other thing that that sort of has caught my eye, and again, uh, this goes back to what what Chase said earlier in terms of sort of a petered out uh, in in terms of the rally. Uh, if you look at the, the June, July, and August volatility curves, we're really sort of balanced. You know, you get that classic sort of volatility curve smile. So from my standpoint, when you start to see that kind of stuff, you you, you start to think that people are not really, there's, there's not necessarily a bias in one direction or other, and we're thinking we, we may just trend around here for a while. So from that standpoint, when the curve starts to look like that, um, you know, maybe, maybe it's time that the, the, the you know, we, we may not see an increase in the volatility going forward here, especially if if um, if there's if there's not a lot going on um, 
uh, that's going to affect the price outside of what we saw this week. So I'm seeing a balance curve, and, and that balance came about with with the calls, uh, the calls, the calls getting bid and the puts getting offered. So we saw that you know that's what we we spend our time looking at, right? So if you look at the delta curve here, we definitely see a shift in the delta curve. So we saw the the call side kind of you grab the the tail of the volatility curve and pulled it up, and so we flattened it out. So you're seeing from a 25 delta to 25 delta, you're seeing sort of it looks like a soup bowl. So you're kind of flat. Um, from the 25 delta to 25 delta um, with a little bit of a lift, you know, at the edges there. So you're holding the soup in there. So we're, um, we have balanced volatility curves, a real vol bid this week, and sort of, uh, you know, all the quick skew numbers, at least, you know, we look at, I tend to stay, um, you know, June and July, 34 and 63 days, respectively. Those, you know, those are pretty good perfect smile at this point uh, with calls definitely getting um, favored uh, this week over the put. So we saw some change in direction there a little bit. That's kind of the biggest thing I think that that uh, uh, has made a difference, just the call bid and the put offer, but really just the balance of the volatility curve uh, more than anything else. And you know, when we look at the term structure here, if we look at uh, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, we're within a range of you know, a half of all percent. So that, you know, if that's the case, then it might be time to take advantage of, of this as a, an opportunity to sell some volatility. And I know the market's done for the day, but we'll see what happens um, uh, 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 over the weekend on the Sunday open and then to see if we continue through here. So, if, you know, I'm again, not knowing anything other than what I look at the numbers, it might be a chance to, to sort of sell some stuff and uh, take advantage of that little boost that we got uh, this week. I like that. Sell some stuff out there. So, well, it's been a while since we've said you could reasonably and reliably sell some crude vol, but then maybe this is the level. You're right. It has kind of spiked up, and we've seen pretty much in the past just about every other spike in crude vol that we've seen has been short-lived and met with a pretty pronounced uh, ret retracement shortly thereafter in the sessions later. So probably not a bad wager, and we're certainly at the upper end of our recent range in terms of near-term uh, crude vol. So maybe an opportunity. Uh, to profit on some retracements there. Tracy, obviously, crude is your baby. This is your wheelhouse. So before we wrap up with crude, uh, I'll give you our ch a chance to give us any last thoughts you have on maybe this week's move or what you're seeing out there right now or the futures or the options or perhaps even maybe what you're looking at for next week from a crude perspective. Well, I think that, I mean, you call it, I mean, you've noticed a giant increase in, and I've been watching that too um, on, you know, those, on those 60 puts. And, you know, when we're this stretched, the odds are, you know, we got to let a little bit of air out of this market, you know. And so I think that's what traders are looking at. Um, you know, at these levels, you'd be crazy not to, you know, to, to buy some puts or, or sell a vol, however you want to approach it. Um, because we're a little bit stretched here. <laughs> um, so, and generally, uh, you know, generally Mondays typically tend to be bearish. So I'm looking for next next week to get a little bit of air taken out of this market, unless, you know, we end up bombing the Middle East. Hopefully we will not. But aside from any geopolitical risks, you know, I think that, and you're, I'm, I'm starting to see it in the volume being traded too. I mean, we had an update today too, but there was no real buying. So I think this market's about ready to take a little bit of a breath. Yeah, and along the same lines, uh, Trace, if you've listened to the show before, um, but my, my take on something like that, you said at this level, buying puts, essentially the same thing. And one thing I've always sort of done throughout my time trading is is to look for a run up like this and instead of maybe buying a put I'll I'll buy a I'll, I'll buy calls especially if they happen to be on the cheaper side in this case it may not necessarily be the same recipe but I'll buy calls and then hedge them or over hedge them because right. you expect a retracement so now you can sort of use an option to scalp your futures as well so I like I like these sort of pushes towards the top or moves towards the bottom because then you could really you can you can use uh, uh, an option and gamma to trade your futures more effectively and then maybe get if something bad happens you 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 still have the volatility to support yourself so. right you know and looking here at some of the other the other product categories we got to squeeze in a few more here 
uh, for the week. We did ask our audience, and they have you guys obviously have some thoughts. We asked you what you want us to talk about this week. We gave you four choices. We gave you crude oil, which we already hit, uh, gold, S&P 500, or Bitcoin. I have your votes here, so I know how you voted. But Tracy, you're our guest, so I'll give you pride of place. If there's any of those other product categories, maybe a little gold and metals, maybe a little bit of S&P or indexes, maybe a little bit of crypto that uh, piques your curiosity, now is the time. Have at it, madam. Let us know what you like. Um, I, I, I trade a little bit. Of, yes, I don't trade gold, but I follow gold, obviously, um, just because I, you know, I pretty much watch you know, all, all the commodities. Um, I don't really trade crypto. Can't really help you out there. <laughs> but but yes, and, and gold, definitely. All right, maybe we'll do a little bit of gold. That's been an interesting one from a ball perspective this week as well. So let's pull that up again, listeners. You guys can follow along, cmegroup.com slash twifo and the gold bulls already happy this week as well maybe not quite the crazy gold bugs who always wanted to go up 100 handles a week but we got 10 handles take what you can get uh, gold closing out the week 1345 up about 10 handles a little bit shy of one percent out there this is a uh, this is a product that again we're seeing some uh, we talked for a long time on the show about how gold ball was at or near, you know, around five-year lows. So we're starting to see that come off now. Uh, we're up a couple of handles out there in the GBZ, which is the gold VIX. And we're seeing a couple of handles out here, or at least a handle or so, depending on where you're looking on the term structure out here in uh, the big COMEX gold contracts here as well. So vol coming up. So if you've been listening to us for a while saying, you know, gold ball kind of cheap, uh, worked out for you pretty well this week. In terms of paying the rent, the vol's up, the underlying's up. Uh, the gold bulls are certainly happy out there. In terms of net OI, up pretty strong actually this week, about 5.5%. It's a pretty decent week uh, for gold. And in terms of where the action was out here, it was in the June contract, number one with the bullet, 1,400 calls. So the gold bugs can't get enough. We're at around 13 half. They said, that's not enough for us. We want to get to 1,400. Slinging about 16 or almost 17,000 of those bad boys this week. Uh, pretty much a tie between today and Wednesday. Both doing right about 6,000 contracts apiece. Uh, most of the rest coming on Thursday with about 3,800 contracts. And actually slightly closing. So a lot of back and forth on that 1,400 strike here uh, in gold this week. Everyone had to have it out there. That was where where the lion's share of the action was. And we kind of skip around a little bit here, which is always always fun out here in uh, in good old gold. It wasn't all just one month. It was also in May and also the 1400s, also lighting it up there. But roughly half of what we saw, a little less than half, actually, of what we saw in the June contract, about 7,000 of the 1400s going up in May. Uh, the lion's share kind of tied again between Tuesday and Wednesday, about 21 to 2300 on both days, the rest kind of scattered most of it on Thursday, actually, about 1,700. Net closing on this time, about 1,400 closing. So a little bit of a paper coming off there in, uh, in May, which is, which is kind of interesting. Then we jump back again. And uh, for our number three, actually, we jump down a bit to the 1360s. They're pretty much uh, slightly out of the money 1360s now, doing about 6,000 contracts uh, this week, the lion's share coming on Wednesday, about 2,300. Uh, the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Uh, net slightly closing, so a lot of back and forth. Uh, a little bit of a cage match there on the 1360 strike as well. Also saw action on the 13 halves. Uh, so those are pretty much very close to at the money right now. Uh, about 5,700 of those going up this week. The lion's share actually yesterday, 2,200 uh, net on the week, closing about 1,000. So interesting, as we got rallied towards that strike, I actually saw paper Coming off a little bit there, which is uh, perhaps surprising uh, for uh, for some of you out there. And rounding out our top five here, we go to the 14 quarters back again in June, uh, doing nearly 5,000 contracts this week. Uh, the lion's share coming on Wednesday, 2,600 contracts going up then. Actually, strong opening here, about 2,300 contracts net opening on this strike throughout the week. So a lot of opening. We had slightly closing on the 1400s and then strong opening paper on the 14 quarters here, all of that in June. So, uh, so much for one narrative out here in, uh, in the gold and the shiny stuff this week. Let's look really quickly. We always find some funky paper out here in gold, and that seems to be the case again. Usually it's funky, far upside calls. Kind of what we got going on out here this week as well. You get all the way down to June 2019. Someone's slinging 1,000 in the 19 halves earlier this week. Uh, opening for most of that out there as well. So if, 
if 13 half wasn't bullish enough for you. Someone loving the 19 halves in Dees 2019, 18 halves also getting some love, doing about 700 some odd uh, throughout the week. And if that wasn't quite bullish enough for you, <coughs> actually, we've kind of missed this one. This should have made it into our number two or three of our top five, actually. Good so far down the strike chain. <laughs> it wasn't on the page, but it was actually, it was the Dees 2019 2100 calls doing some size out here, uh, doing nearly 6,000 contracts, 5,700. That would put us squarely in pretty much our two to three camp for our top five. Uh, pretty uh, pretty active contract, 3,300 on Tuesday, 2,400 on Wednesday. Uh, the 2,400 on Wednesday is interesting because the 1,800s also did 1,200 on Wednesday the same day. So I'm wondering if there was maybe a one by two that went up uh, that 1,800, 21, one by two. Uh, either way, 3,300 net of the 2,100 is going up on Tuesday. 5,700, 60 on the week, about half of that opening, 2,740. Uh, so interesting, we don't have the OI numbers on uh, on the Wednesday stuff. Uh, so interesting interesting there, a lot of, lot of outlandish, far out of the money bullish paper. Mr. Nick, what caught your eye out here? Obviously, gold vol up, uh, so that's an interesting narrative. What's catching your eye from a skew perspective? And also, did you happen to see... Uh, these uh, these big blocks going up in the far off calls here was that am I right is that a one by two or is that something else afoot out there? Well, I'll pull up uh, the block trade tool so we can take a look at that while I'm getting myself uh, uh, ready to answer your question here. I mean, as far as um, the quick skew goes, we we definitely saw a little bit of a shift this week, and again, it's it's probably more along the line of rolling uh rolling up and down uh the vol curve more than anything else uh, and i'm going to take a look at that right now just to be double sure i was looking at the yeah so so we you know as we rally we kind of moving up uh moving up the the vol curve uh the way the the way the the shape of the curve is right now so i don't know we, we did have a little bit of a bid but i think we also got a much of uh much of our move as part of just uh sliding up and down you know that little if you put them, you know, put the marble in there and slide it up and down, give it a little push. I think a lot of our vol was just basically with the push up. Um, so that's going to cause our quick skew to be uh, more bid to the calls and have the puts see a little bit more of an offer. So, and, and, and we saw this and, and the shapes are pretty consistent uh, throughout the term structure of the individual vol curves, I think. So, you know, nothing truly uh, spectacular there. I mean, and if you look at um, the historical, we're still sort of trending along a, a cheap volatility range here. So as much as we saw a little bit of spike um, in the last couple of weeks, we're still sort of really, if you looked at it from a really long-term perspective, when you put like the five-year chart out there, you know, we came off some very high highs and we're really just sort of uh, rangy and trending here. And, and we said all along, gold is one of those things where for a long time we were at a certain place. Now, again, we're at a uh, 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 we're within a range and, and, and we, we can do the cop out range of between 1300 and 1400, which is really what it is. But when you start and, and, and it's really probably tighter than that, but if you use the June contract, since that is the contract with the most open interest and you take a look at what's there, you have by a mile, you have the four, the 1400 calls have the greatest open interest in that contract. And then the 1200 puts now, you can also look at the 1250s and the 1300. So if you really look in, in that, you you have a lot of, it's going to take, I think you have some real resistance points at like the 1375, and then the next would be the 1400. And we can get those kind of moves in a day. Um, but uh, even 1350 as sort of a downside barrier. So, you know, a bigger range, 1300 to 1400, sort of a tighter range, uh, 1350 to 1400. And again, probably even bouncing between the, 1350 and 1375. So, um, so a, a similar thing. If we keep kind of rolling around in this in this range, you see any kind of vol bid. The vol is going to be what, what some people term as local vol. You just kind of swing it up and down on the vol curve without there really being anything uh, anything there from a from a you know a increase in premium. But in that kind of situation, you can you can buy some. Uh, <laughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze. You can buy some buy some options, and you can scalp, especially given that we're seeing you know the thing bounce around quite a bit. So, um, always like watching gold. Always like watching crude because the the, the ranges really do come into play from an open interest standpoint. 
Tracy, obviously you mentioned you watch some uh, you watch some some gold, some shiny stuff as well. Nick and I just broke down kind of all the options actually and the volatility out there. Uh, what's been catching your eye out there in gold of late? Are, are you buying this rally? And what, what do you like to trade out there in gold? Are you futures, a combo of futures and options like you are with crude or are some other mix they're in? No, I just watch gold. I don't actually trade gold. Um, but since it's, you know, I mean, since it's uh, very governed with the euro and the dollar, you know, it's kind of metals and energies are kind of very similar in a lot of ways, <laughs> even though it doesn't sound like it. Um, so I always have metal screen up as well as um, the energy screen up. Well, there you go, listeners. You got a little bit of your gold in. And speaking of listeners, you guys have been busy firing off your questions for us. So let's get to it a little bit of your futures options feedback. It's time for your questions, comments, and insights. It's time for futures options feedback. Submit your questions at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, stocktwits.com slash options insider, or via questions at the options you can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider Radio Network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live every Friday at 3 p.m. Central via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at Mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, everybody, welcome to the Futures Options Feedback, the portion where you guys take the reins, questions, comments, insights, pearls of wisdom. Uh, we welcome them all. We actually asked you guys uh, at the top of the show there what you want us to hit on. Uh, we gave you choices. Bitcoin, crude oil, S&P, and gold. Uh, crude and S&P tying with 27%. Uh, Bitcoin actually taking around 37%, 9% for gold. Uh, so we'll get in maybe some of your, uh, some of your crypto theories in a little bit uh, we got a lot of good questions actually got some here since uh since tracy you're our guest we'll get somebody that are in your uh, your neck of the woods your wheelhouse which is uh which is crude let's start off with this one this comes from ken uh, ken aiden he says i'm a crude swinger i hope he doesn't mean that in the literal sense uh mostly trading short-term direction intraday in the futures uh he wants to know are the options good for this use case or is that more for a long-term um, long-term strategies. This is the question we get a lot. We get asked a lot about the use cases for options, particularly intraday. That's why I, that's why I wanted to pick your brain about that at the top of the show, uh, Tracy, because we get this question a lot. Uh, clearly, you told us your use case, so I, I kind of think I know where you land, but what do you have to say here for our listener, Ken? Do you think options are good for intraday in, uh, in crude, or do you prefer the futures for that use case? Oh, no, absolutely. You can, you can flip options, too, during the day. Um, you know, if you, you know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, any kind of move, I mean, I day trade options all the time. So, you know, absolutely you can do it. You can either do it directional, um, you know, you can, you know, or, you know, I know a lot of people that, um, buy straddles or strangles and play it that way, or, you know, uh, outright directional puts or calls. Um, uh, but people day trade the options in the crude market all the time. Yeah, you know, we said that before here on the show. There is a good use case. You can intraday and day trade options. It does happen. It does exist. A lot of people like to use longer term use cases, but people trade them intraday too. Nick and I, you, you, Nick, you and I have talked about this quite a bit on the show uh, before. Anything else you want to add for our friend here, Mr. Mr. Ken? No, I, I think that's kind of what I was getting at with Tracy early on uh, about the weeklies. I think uh, if nothing else, as, as, uh, as those become more, liquid and then as the regular contracts get get to be shorter dated you know you can really start to treat and I, and I like actually hearing Tracy say how people are buying straddles and 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 doing other things to support or to uh, or to defend the position because that's really what it's for right and it's always it's always interesting to hear uh, that they're out there really doing that but I still think that you know once the weeklies become uh, that where we can where we can really get some good markets and and the decent liquidity, then you just you know especially for the yeah. shorter day ones, you can treat them like a binary options, right, Trace? I mean, it would be a real easy yeah. way to sort of just like flip a coin. 
Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, you know, I think it's, you know, just a matter of people, you know, the market getting just a little bit more liquid. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I always say I wish the weeklies were a little bit more liquid because they'd be a lot easier. It's a lot easier to, you know, intraday trade them. And they're a little bit less less expensive, too. We have another question here from Luke, also in the crude realm. Uh, Luke T, it's, it's kind of funny one, actually. He says, well, why does USO suck so badly? Uh, not sure why anyone would trade this over the futures. Uh, I like that. That's a funny one. So, uh, yeah, Tracy, uh, answer for Luke. Why does uh, why does he say, at least, that USO is terrible? We've talked before about some of our, our issues here on the show uh, with USO. You know, you're going to get into these issues uh, whenever you have these uh, these kind of aggregate hybrid products that are attempting to replicate something else through a basket of something else in the case of futures or there's always going to be roll yield issues and things like that. But uh, uh, from your perspective, Tracy, uh, are you a fan of USO? Or are you not a fan? What do you think? Do you agree with Luke T that it, quote, sucks so badly? I'm not a fan. I don't trade it. I don't trade any ETFs because you get screwed on the roll, basically. So, um, you know, it's not something that you can hold for any length of time if it's going against you or I just don't like ETFs. I have to be honest. Um, so for the same reasons that you have already stated, I mean, you have the major problem is, is the role. There you go. You're a futures girl. You're a futures girl for a reason. Yeah, you're right. That role really, really eats into it. It's kind of hard. You can't put USO in your IRA and set it and forget it. Cause uh, spoiler alert, it won't work out too well. Uh, not quite as bad as like a let's say a VXX, which will erode to zero, but it won't quite give you the same the same performance that you're looking for out if you had like a let's say a WTI future in there or something along those lines. I don't know, Mr. Nick, any uh, any additional thoughts you want to add here on USO or just the ETFs versus futures kind of debate? Well, I think there was another related question in here. I, I think we can we jump into the to the to the the Thomas's question because I could tie both of the, my my response into okay. both of yeah, those. Okay, yeah, sure, I'll read that right. one too. We got Thomas Thomas F. He says um, I used to trade a lot of spy options, but I've been lured over to the E minis. Not sure why more, why more people don't trade these things. What do you think it is that keeps people trading spy instead of the E mini? What can be done to bring them to the dark side? So you're right, Mister Nick. A uh, somewhat analogous question here on SPY as well. What do you have to say for Thomas Thomas F. and Luke T.? Well, I mean, first off, I, I think I, from my own perspective, like like I always say, is as much as I have a futures and futures options experience, you know, get that that market still seems much more difficult, I guess, from uh, because there's all because the because of the margin calculation and the and how much you have to have in your account and all that kind of thing, whereas the spy in the USO you can treat like an equity, right? And and uh, I think it's probably just because it feels more familiar the other two, and and agree. I've heard um, I haven't traded USO, but my my friends that trade USO they hate it because of the role and the spy. If the one thing that people probably don't realize is that you can probably be more efficient with the E minis if you go look at the total cost analysis tools over on the CME Group website. Um, you can go over there and see what your cost of trading is. You're going to see you're better off uh, being an E-mini. So I think that I like hearing Tracy say that she hates the USO because it it just makes sense that this, the liquidity in the in the crude um, on the CME is just so much better. And the fact that there's all kinds of other stuff that you can do and you actually can do options that tie to the underlying that will really hedge your your position or, or trade with your position can't do that with the USO because people ask us about that. Can I do my options against the USO underlying? And and typically it just I don't even doesn't know work how that you way. do that. It no, doesn't, it doesn't work that way. You can't really do it. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, it doesn't. Right. You just can't. <laughs> Yeah, it'd be, it'd be nice if those things uh, worked out that way. But you're right. You know, there is that that convenience factor, and that drives a lot of volume in the ETFs. They can put them in their traditional equities and securities account, and they don't have to open up a futures account. And set. that used to be a much more of a problem a few years back. A lot of the brokers have done a great job of really, really making that process pretty seamless. Click on a couple of buttons, and now you have a futures account, and you don't even notice. It's not you used to, have to go to a separate site or a separate section to do it. Now it's all kind of seamless. All one looks like one account, even though effectively it is two. So they've done a good job of making 
that easier. I think that's helped to eliminate some of the barriers to entry. But there are still some people out there, but that's just too uh, a bridge too far for them to jump into uh, the future. In which case, you're listening to the wrong show. But uh, we'll, we'll let you listen anyway. One more here for you, Mr. Nick. This one's right up your alley. I'll let you, obviously, I'll let you handle uh, this one. This comes from your old buddy, Mr. Brandt. Uh, he, he, wants, he wants some very specific data from you guys out of Quick Strike. He says he's partial to selling 45-day straddles. Uh, does Quick Strike highlight the highest implied vol straddles of the CME products? It would be cool to sell the richest straddles daily. He wants to do it daily. 45-day uh, straddle decay is a universal sweet spot to avoid gamma risk, but only at implied vol extremes, and even then one can lose a little. Uh, span margin is ideal for CME straddles. I will gladly pay for 45-day straddle IV reports. Rich straddles are an edge. So there you go, Mr. Mr. Nick, uh, a customer willing to pay for new functionality. What do you think? Yeah, I, I did respond back to him because there's, there's to me, and it, well, there's only one problem with that. We can we do 30 and 60-day stuff, in particular with QuickSkew, but we can we can generate that report for that at the monies. Uh, on the 30-day and 60-day accounts of maturity very easily. So two things is you can't necessarily always trade a 30, a 45, or a 60-day straddle, but you can go find something that's close to that, right? So you're, there's always going to be a hybrid uh, to that approach. But um, but you can at, we can absolutely generate those reports. I mean, we can do them right now. I, I, and I, and I, I had something in the queue for the 30 and 60-day. We'll have to do a little work to get a 45-day calc in there. But, um, but, but yeah, those things... I think what I'm seeing now, you know, we've done our best to to sort of give people the information that they need to help them make decisions. I think people want even more where we even tip them in one direction or other. Now we can't necessarily do that because we're, that's not what our job is, but we can, we can start alerting people um, with particular reports for, for requests that they have. So feel free to ask and typically uh, you receive, uh, we'll, we put it in the list and if we can knock them out quickly, uh, we do. So, uh, but that one should be coming uh, not so far off because we can, we can do the 30 and the 60, like I said, fairly quickly. Uh, and that report's probably almost there from an at the money standpoint. And, uh, but then at that point, you're just gonna have to still make decisions on which option you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna uh, participate uh, selling um, because you're not gonna get the perfect uh, match with your 45 day uh, days to expiration. There you go, listeners. Ask and you shall receive, even if you're on some esoteric data kick. Everyone wants different data, Mr. Nick. They always want, they only want to sell 38 and a half day uh, straddles. What do you got? What do you got for those people? But see, ask and you shall receive with the data. Unfortunately, don't ask for more show because that music means we're done. We've come to the end of our epic sojourn through the world of futures options. Hit on a lot of crude, touched on some shiny stuff and a few other areas. The, the myriad nuanced differences between ETFs and futures and all the other fun stuff you guys have on your brain. We didn't get to all your questions. Keep them coming. We do love hearing from you guys. We read them all. We try to respond to them all. If not, don't get to all of them on the show. But you get your answers one way or the other. But before we go... We go back around the horn. Let's start with our guest, Tracy. You get pride of place. If our listeners are intrigued, they want to hear more of your thoughts about the uh, about the crude markets, where should they go? What should they do? Uh, I'm on Twitter at ShyGirl. And um, I also have a blog, ShyGirl.com. There you go. That's C-H-I-G-R-L on, uh, on Twitter. And I believe it's the same on uh, on the blog as well. Yes, GRL on the blog as well. I know she haven't posted on the blog since like January, Tracy. You gotta get you gotta get that going again. i I know I'm terrible. Content's hard work, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Seriously. <laughs> Everyone thinks this job is easy, but it's actually it takes some time. Uh, all right, and uh, Mr. Nick, last but not least, sir, you just mentioned your your cool new 45 day straddle report. If that's not enough cooking, what else you guys got up your sleeve over there in the land of Quick Strike? Oh, uh, well, like I said, I said we work towards getting something out there. I think we can get the 30 and 60 day um, right away for them. I mean, in terms of our next build. But what else we got cooking? You know, uh, I got always say appoint everybody to the free stuff first. Uh, take a look and see if there's any more detail that you need. And then come on over and check out the subscription-based stuff. But we'll be putting out some... Uh, some new uh, 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 
economic calendar tools that are tied to the uh, that are, that are tied to the CME Group uh, option expiration. So you're able to look at both of those at the same time. So that will be coming out fairly soon. So you'll get a calendar of events, and then to the to one side, you'll also see all the expirations that are associated with with those particular um, economic events. So there's going to be some really good practical tools coming out there, and. Um, if you haven't looked at it yet, you can go take a look at the strategy simulator that, that the CME just released. Uh, that is a tool we built that's out on the cmegroup.com slash quick strike page. But uh, as always, give the tools a look. There's something for everybody, even for futures traders only. You can use options information to trade futures. So you got to keep that in mind. There you go. Check it out. Bantix.com, B-A-N-T-I-X.com. And click on the Check out Quick Strike link there. You can see it for yourself. Of course, our friends over there at CME Group. Head over to cmegroup.com slash twifo. Click around there. Maybe check out some of Blue's videos, Eric's, all the rest of the content they got floating around over there. Some of the great futures education. You got questions about futures versus DTFs? They got some content for you over there. Check it out over there at CME Group. And on behalf of Tracy, Mr. Nick, our friends at CME, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing, sending in such great questions, all the other fun stuff that you do. And we'll see you next week for more of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered. With market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility, QuickStrike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about QuickStrike at Bantix.com. That's B-A-N-T-I-X dot com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at QuickStrike1. That's Q-U-I-K-S-T-R-I-K-E-1. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com. 